Welcome back to another episode of the School of Why podcast. Today, we've got an incredible guest, Jason Barger. Jason, how are you? I'm great. Good to be with you, Frankie. Jason, I I, I know that you recently um, released your fourth book called Breathing Oxygen. So before we get too, uh, you know, into the weeds on this interview, I wanted you to just kind of tell me a little bit about it. And, and I guess my first question is, what else would we be breathing? <laughs> I love it. That's a good question. Uh, of course, we were always breathing oxygen, but, uh, you know, really the book is about a metaphor for an inspired coming out of the pandemic and everything we've been experiencing over the last couple okay, of years. Gotcha. So this it isn't is... a book about, uh, you know, global warming and pollution no. and whatnot. Oh, no. thank God, because I was worried this was going to turn into a political podcast. And, you know, for obvious reasons, I try to avoid all that. No, I do as well, buddy. Um, <laughs> no, it's about what are the Don't mindsets. Don't want to get canceled too this early in the morning. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It, it it's about what you know. What are those mindsets that we are intentionally kind of breathing in, and what is it that we, you know, we all know that there are oxygen givers and oxygen takers. You know, you walk into any meeting, any company, any situation, and there's people that kind of fill the room and kind of bring bring energy to the room, and and also we know that and I think the last couple of years taught us this that. Man, there were times where we needed to breathe in different oxygen. We needed to to fuel our mindsets in a way that wasn't leading us down that kind of toxic path of negativity and blame and finger pointing and gossip and all that kind of stuff. So mm. it's really about those kind of six key leadership mindsets of how do we breathe that in for ourselves? And then what does it look like to breathe oxygen into other people's, into the cultures that we're trying to create? That's great. I love that. And and are your other books in line with the same kind of mentality of how we can be givers and better servant leaders and things like that? Is that kind of a theme for you? Yeah. I mean, I think that that's, uh, that's certainly, that's a part of who I am for sure, authentically. And then also, uh, I just think it's um, the type of work that I'm doing in terms of developing leaders and culture and clarity around mission, vision, and values that's the stuff that uh, I see a lot of teams and a lot of leaders and a lot of organizations really struggling with, or at least trying to gain clarity on. So mm. each, you know, each of my four books has a, a slightly different message and angle on on this stuff. And my most recent book, before breathing oxygen, is called Thermostat Cultures, and that's really about what is the process we go through to proactively shape the culture we want, not just yeah. The, culture that we're experiencing interesting so you know one of the things that i i always focus on on specifically on this podcast when it comes to this idea of why right into school of why and i i have yeah. this belief that all of our purpose is the same at like the most basic level and then from there it's our passion that helps us kind of dictate how our purpose is going to come out right so our pr purpose in my opinion um is to be leaders all of us in different ways and in different rooms and being a leader means helping others, right? And and putting others first. And what happens as a result of that, as you know, is is very powerful things uh, come back to you, right? And it's not money, but sometimes it's money. But a lot of times it's it's you know it's other pieces to the puzzle. Um, but it's that passion that can help us kind of decide where we're going to put that purpose. And I don't know uh, what how you feel about that. Obviously, you've been doing this. You said thirteen years, right? So, yeah. this you've been in this this journey of helping others, and m that passion you have for helping others and making that a lifestyle. Um, you know, what do you see as like like some of the the some real important things? Um, maybe it's a life hack or something like that uh, that you feel like are. If you took one, I know your book has multiple pillars. What would you say is six pillars? Yeah. Yeah, six mindsets. Yes. What would you say for people that are watching this that maybe um they're not they don't have time right now or they haven't read the book yet? What what would you say is a good starting point for somebody who's just an everyday person that is feeling really kind of bogged down from mentally, physically, maybe spiritually from this whole pandemic and everything else? Like where do you start with somebody like that? Yeah. So, you know, one of the terms that gets thrown around so much, especially in the world today and in teams and organizations, as we talk about, if you read any article right now, that's talking about how important culture is and how important purpose and all that stuff that you just were talking about is 
uh, one of the f- terms that gets thrown around is emotional intelligence and, 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 mm-hmm. and how much we as individuals, but then also within the teams and organizations that we serve, that we need to raise our level of emotional intelligence in order to navigate our way through everything we're facing, right? But oftentimes we throw around terms like that, but we don't really take the time. Yeah, because really I mean, emotional mean. intelligence. Yeah. You, so do you, you kind of dive into some of the emotional intelligence in your book? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's yeah, that's that seems like a natural fit. My, I, you know, my second book ended up being a little less about just mastering your purpose and more about how do you hack and rebuild sh- strategic emotions is what I call them um, in order to get to that authentic success. Right. Because emotions play such a massive role. Um, and if you harness them, whether they're good or bad, it, it can play into it. So tell me, what, what do you when you think of emotional intelligence, because there are more than one definition of what it is, how, how do you define emotional intelligence? Yeah, so emotional intelligence is that, that first and foremost, it starts with our ability or inability to recognize how we are feeling and what we are experiencing and what we are seeing from our, our perspective, right? So in our, our bodies and in our experience right now, our awareness of what we're feeling and seeing, and then also, the ability or inability to recognize that in somebody else. So there's a there's a personal competency side of this and then a social mm-hmm. competency side of it. So I can I then perceive what I see you might be feeling or thinking and experiencing in this moment. But then emotional intelligence isn't just the recognition and awareness of that. It's then our ability or again inability to use that recognition and awareness to then what's the behavioral response we're gonna bring? What's the action we're gonna put based on how I know in any given situation I'm feeling and seeing what I'm experiencing, what I perceive you to be feeling, seeing and thinking. And then what is it that I'm gonna do? Like, and so my language, how am I gonna calibrate the thermostat? Like what is the temperature I'm trying to set based on what it is that I'm experiencing? And And so your question about a life hack in terms of purpose, I mm-hmm. believe begins with our own recognition and awareness for ourselves, and taking time to reflect on, well, what, it, what are those things that kind of bring out the best in us? You know, what, mm. what is it that, what are the things that breathe oxygen into me as a human, as a, as a spouse, as a, a dad, as a, and then certainly within the, the work that I'm grateful to get to do in the world, what are the things that kind of bring out the best in me? and kind of bring me energy and, and also to be aware and recognize what are those things that seem to be kind of stealing my oxygen? What are those things that those that mm-hmm. maybe mm-hmm. are limiting beliefs or limiting the air, the air doesn't bring out the best in me. And, and from that awareness, then I can begin to say, well, well, which of these do I want to feed more, right? Which of path? Course. Uh, so that I can begin to walk, I think, to use your language, to, to walk closer and more in alignment with that purpose. Uh, but if I don't even have that recognition and awareness of those things, don't even have that emotional intelligence, mm-hmm. then we're walking a fog. Right. Yeah, and that's interesting that you, that you said that because um, I talk a lot about this idea of, you know, first and foremost, it, my most recent talk is called Inauthentic Existence. And that is um, uh, something I'm very passionate about. And it, I'm, I'm thinking it'll probably be my third book uh, because I, it's just it's so uh, relevant right now. Right. And this idea of of inauthenticity and, and, and the way that plays out and the misconceptions of inauthenticity and what happens when I show up authentically. Right. And if I'm showing up authentically, I got to believe that that means I'm showing up breathing oxygen. Right. That's my right. authentic self is not breathing in all the negative stuff. And, and a lot of times we got to go all the way back to childhood and, and revisit who we were before we started breathing so much negative oxygen, as you say. Yeah. Um, so I, I love that. I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's about, you know, first and foremost, getting honest. And it sounds like that's kind of w- what you're doing here. And, and, and then I, I, my next thing I usually will step into is taking inventory and the taking inventory is okay. Like you just said, what, breathe uh, breathes oxygen into me and what's take what's breathing out and then so then from there it's like okay whatever is the negative uh oxygen or uh, what is it co2 what do you call the negative what is the bad oxygen 
Well, what do you yeah, call I mean, it in the book? Let's just call it for or it's for just ease, a lack of listener, oxygen. Let's just call it pollution. Let's call it uh, okay. Know, this is the yeah pollution. There yeah, this go. is the carbon dioxide, or this is the you know uh, what the pollution image, am I breathing? It exactly. And well, how? Image, do, and then the, so yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, well, yeah, I was just to say the the image again because I think I think people then listeners uh, think in, in imagery, right? So I think it's helpful to us. So uh, every day when I wake up, or every day when you wake up, or anybody listening. Uh, whether we know it or not, and again, the higher level of emotional intelligence, the more intentional we will become with all this stuff. But we start mm -hmm. to, to, to recognize every single day we have an opportunity. Do I, you know, kind of go over and, and, and put the oxygen mask on for a second and kind of breathe in some good oxygen, things that, that fuel my mind and help me prepare for the type of person and what, bring out the best of what I'm trying to do in the world? Or do I, you know, walk over and stand, you know, behind the exhaust from a car and mm -hmm. stand there and breathe in that stuff that we all know makes us unhealthy and doesn't bring out the best in us. And yet every single day as individuals and then also with teams and organizations, we build habits of f falling into the trap of kind of staying in a space that really isn't bringing out the best or mindsets, stories we're telling ourselves air that we're breathing that doesn't really help our performance. And yet we stay there and we stand there and we keep breathing it because that's the habit we form. Yeah. And we just, and we, we just kind of accept that this is the way things are. And, and, and so it's a big part of your work, encouraging people to move uh, away from those things or to change the positions. I mean, what are some things that come to mind? I know for me, I think of sometimes it's a relationship or the way you show up to a relationship. Yep. I mean, almost in every scenario, it's going to be something like that, whether it's a yep. relationship to my job, it's a relationship to a person, um, their relationship to me. So, I mean, do you talk about like boundaries or, you know, how, how deep do you go into it in your book as far as like, how am I supposed to repurpose or focus yep. away from the pollution, get pollution, get into the oxygen? What, what, where do you go yeah, with that? Every single chapter talking about these different mindsets, I talk about the mindset of how breathing oxygen every time that we return to clarity. And I talk about mm -hmm. clarity as an individual, finding clarity around what is our mission? What is that? Why again, the yeah. purpose, what is, what is the, the vision for, for where we're trying to go? What is the how? So the values of how we're committed to traveling and then what, what is the strategy? So based on those things, what is it we're going to do next? So, for us individually, but then also, again, this is written in such a way that in, in a lot of the work that I do is with teams and organizations that are are lacking that clarity as groups and as teams and in as entire companies. And so each of these mindsets, whether it's clarity uh, that I talk about, inclusivity, whether I'm talking about mental agility, talking about grit and uh, rest. That, that really rest is a secret to elite performance. We dive into that kind of mindset around that. And then yeah. personal ownership and accountability and redefining what we even mean by the term accountability that, that has been hijacked over the years. And so each one of those at the end of the chapters, it, it talks about, so what are some actions and behaviors that we inhale to kind of breathe in, to help kind of fuel those mindsets? And what are actions and behaviors that we need to exhale and kind of let go of and get away from Mm -hmm. and move from. So there's personal, you know, uh, uh, suggestions about how we practice this stuff. And then what within teams and organizations, uh, you know, you talk about moving the, the way we shape culture is that culture is dynamic, which means it's always changing. And yet oftentimes with our teams and organizations, we, we haven't identified a strategy around what is that culture that we're trying to create together. And then mm. what are we going to, what are we going to do from a structure perspective? What are we going to put into place to help us create that culture that we're committed to? And then how do we as individuals throughout the ecosystem of our team or organization, how do we breathe oxygen into that over time so that five years from now, 10 years from now, somebody says, oh, yeah, that company on our team, that's just the way that we do it. And the reality yeah. is that's now just become the air that we breathe because of many different tiny little hundreds, if not thousands of millions, intentional little actions and behaviors mm -hmm. that have helped shape the culture we want. 
Yeah, I always talk about this idea of one one degree. Like if you ch can just change something by one degree, over time it be it becomes a much larger wedge when you're thinking of it like, you yeah, know, yeah. In, a, in a circle of degrees. And and I think that's important. I think a lot of times people get overwhelmed because it's it just feels too big to even start, you yeah. know? So I, I like that you're kind of breaking it down. Now you you said something that I actually am curious about. You said this a misconception of accountability. Isn't accountability just, you know, having another human that can hold you accountable or some sort of regulator that is going to hold you to this standard or something along those lines, keep you honest. I mean, where has it gone off the rails as you see it as far as accountability? Well, even, even in some of that language that, that we have become accustomed to, to using and especially within teams and, and organizations, again, it's a, it's a so, so commonly used this way that it's become kind of an epidemic that we only talk about accountability in the sense of when we're going to quote unquote, hold someone accountable. And so accountability becomes a slap on the wrist or a, uh, I'm only going to talk to you, Frankie, when I have something. I need you to you, help me not do bad. You, you didn't hold up your end of the bargain in our relationship. And yeah. so I'm going to, I'm going to quote unquote, hold you accountable to that. And so I'm going to call uh, you out. And so, so it ends up having a connotation of being wrong and then maybe in turn having a, a result of shame. That's right. As far so as like the nature within, of the relationship. Absolutely. Within relationships, okay. when we, you know, accountability is only about the things that we did let, you know, let each other down with within teams and organizations, the people say we don't have any accountability because it, you know, or this negative sense of it, because we're, it's all about catching people doing it, you know, what, what they, how mm -hmm. they didn't live up to, to their end of the bargain. And the reality is more times than not, we are more accountable to one another than we are less accountable to each other. And so the, the healthiest relationships and the healthiest teams and organizations, they understand and they redefine and have a better association with what that term accountability even means. And so we recognize and celebrate all of the ways in which we are accountable to each other when we live up to what we said we were going to do. And therefore, hmm. that doesn't mean we shy away from those moments when we know we can do better and there's opportunity for improvement, but that's not the only time we're going to hear about it. And so there's, there's a, 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 a place called the Gottman Institute out of, out of Seattle that did this, uh, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version, but did this research on healthy relationships and teams and all that. And really what they yeah. found is on, 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 they could predict with amazing accuracy around what relationship and or team was going to last and which one eventually was going to blow up based on just watching their interactions of the people involved. And what they found was that there was about a five to one ratio of positive interactions to negative interactions, those healthier relationships, which once again, recognize, point out, value, uh, you know, uh, name the ways in which they are positively accountable to one another are the ones that end up uh, thriving and, and growing and becoming something new. The ones that, that are in that kind of one-to-one -one ratio, or in some cases, even worse than that, where they are, again, only, only catching them doing things in the wrong and negative are the ones that- Which is more, I mean, it's common. It's That's common. Right. I mean, I hate to say it. I mean, the reality is that business is set up to make money. And so it, where it gets, it gets rough. It, I mean, it, this happens in our personal lives too, but I think sometimes it's easier to stay positive in a personal life, depending on, you know, who's in your personal life. Um, then, then this corporate deal, because the corporate thing, we, everybody kind of signs off on it. So it's like, everybody just assumes like, look, we got to go to work. We got to get up and, and do this deal. We have an objective. It's it's related to money. And then we're just going to worry about how we're going to live our life outside of this. You know what I'm saying? We're just going to focus on whatever this money can come out of this. Then that's the purpose of me being at work so that I can just do stuff when I'm not at work. And to be honest, that's why it's such there's such massive bu uh, burnout. And, and there's a lot of people just kind of throwing their hands up, especially this whole new generation, right? Yeah, um, no, I, and, I, I would agree with everything you're saying, and, and, and I would I would uh, I would lean into or I guess nudge or challenge us to, to say that I think traditionally that has been a lot of the mindset. And yet also what from context of what we're what we're experiencing right now in the world and what I'm seeing throughout 
teams and organizations across industries over the last 13 years and what statistics and research tell us what's happening right now is we have a time in which over 30 million people in the last 12 months have resigned from jobs. It's continuing at about a Crazy. 4 million a, a month clip. And, and, and the U.S. Department by the of way, Labor is saying that it's where are they not going? going anywhere. Where are they yeah. going? Are they not well, working at all? Or are many, they just many finding are, other you know, what, what some of the language they're start to, starting to bring to it is, is not referring to the great resignation, but it's becoming kind of the great rethink, which means that okay. what is happening is, is some people, yes, are jumping from one industry to another and are, and are you know, wanting to try something new. Others, two income families that are rethinking the life that they want to have and are and are saying, hey, maybe we can make it on one income. And we're going to change our oh, lifestyle. OK, way. so so a nice percentage of it is, is going down to one person working, one person being the, there for the kids more. The, the traditional kind of work or the dogs, the corporate, whatever they're in into. the corporate setting, you know, <laughs> that. Uh, yeah. The, uh, the traditional work in the corporate setting, again, where the, the world is different now. We have a gig economy. I mean, just on this call as we were beginning, you were talking about some of the things that you're doing and, and, and entering this, this gig economy that more and more people are able to work remotely and freelance and do stuff. Yeah. And so they're rethinking what is this relationship that I have with work and my life. And, mm -hmm. what I, and so where I was going to lean into is that the companies again that I'm that I'm working with and that I'm a part of that I'm partnering with are the ones that are are realizing that just want to, a job just for money and even though mm -hmm. that's a myth that's a myth or that's something that we once believed the mindset we once believed all the research is telling us that's not true yeah people are leaving in record numbers and what they're saying is i want to be a part of something where i'm a part of a more meaningful culture where I can contribute and be a part of something. I want a place that has a yeah. compelling purpose, that has mm -hmm. a, um, a mission greater than ourselves and, and values me as a human being and helps me with this relationship between the life I want to lead and the ways in which I want to contribute to whatever mm -hmm. it is this said company is trying to grow and develop. And, yeah, I think and, people, I think, yeah, go ahead, keep going. Well, I was just going to say, and, and the, what the research and what idea. everything's telling us is when people don't feel that, they will go somewhere else. Yeah. And so we're in a great reckoning right now of what does, what does the talk about the future of work? We are creating it right now as to what are the mm -hmm. types of cultures that we are committed to lead and create as leaders, teams, and companies. Yeah, it's interesting how people uh, and this whole new generations have have come to a place where they're they're they've ignored. It's like they have accepted that capitalism is is almost like a god, and that if they're gonna serve that god or pray to that god, then which is going to work every day, then they want to make sure that it's the the type of god they want to serve. And I know that's kind of over the top talking about it as like a deity, but the fact is is that that is kind of the, the deal. It's like, so I, this whole new generation where we thought of philanthropy as something that we do outside of work once we've made some money or whatever. Um, now they're like, okay, we want to buy our products from companies that are doing certain things. And so that's, that's their way of philanthropy is if target, you know, gives money to the, you know, dogs with three legs, then like, I feel good about going to target or whatever. And then, you know, whatever, same thing with the company. So it's like, okay, I'm looking at my life. I got, I'm 25 years old. I'm obviously not 25, but you know, these new generations and or they're 30 and they, they're like, man, I got 35 more years of this. I might as well be someplace where I I'm, I'm making a difference or they're making a difference. And I'm part of that difference, like you said, and they're willing to take less money for it. And I think that's, what's crazy is that um, now and that's the other thing that we're in a whole generation that, that is okay with having low net worth and high experience. Uh, uh, net worth. I, I actually, next week I have, uh, exp the experienced billionaire coming on the show, which actually she has done some amazing things. And, and I'm actually excited about that one. But when I first saw her book title, I was like, Oh God, this is another millennial, uh, you know, Gen Z, all that matters is that you're getting great food pics on Instagram and, you know, traveling. And that's what you need to make sure you don't waste your life not doing, but it ended up being way more purpose driven but to your point you know i mean that's that's where i think this is going and and it is interesting how 
it, just like with consumers, right? Consumers can shift an entire industry when it comes to retail or something like that, right? They, they when they come together on a mindset and it's not, obviously they don't, they don't all know they're doing it, but as those things move, entire industries are forced to shift, right? And so that's what's happening. I think almost when you think of an employee as a consumer to the businesses, right? They're, they're, there's enough of them in, in this mindset that like businesses are going to look very different and continue to look different, you know? So is that, yeah. are you, are you kind of helping businesses work through that? Is that a big part of your journey is, is helping businesses that it's not really been their focus. They're like, come to you and say, you know, where do we start? Is that one of your deals? Yeah. Yeah. I, I become a partner with places that are realizing that yes, now it happens to be that they're realizing it needs to be a strategy in terms of their existence. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if we want to exist in 10 years, then we ought to be, have a strategy on how we're developing our people and our culture. And, and, and uh, oh, by the way, so there's a return on that investment, but oh, by the way, is that that's what people need and want that that's what, that's what every, everybody's telling us. And so if we don't have a, a strategy or intentionality around, well, what is the culture that we're trying to create in this? Uh, in this company. And again, if, if, if you want to say it's just about making money and get clear on that and, 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 and make your boundaries, you know, whatever's authentic for you. And then to that. your point, yeah. the, mar the so market, not everybody has, it not every business has to decide to be come like a do good or business or helping others. No, it, but what they have to do is be authentic and, and, and make sure that that's clear with everyone on the team. So like, I, I think that clarity of vision and mission is as important as whatever the mission and vision is no, you know? no doubt. And, and also yeah. that your people are participating in it. Right. That, that, yeah. That, that they that know what it that's is, what yeah. they truly <laughs> want. And what are we, trying if you to asked everyone today? in your organization, what the mission is as a company, it's not like we're getting hundreds of different answers. Right. Um, that's really interesting, man. So w when you come in with, with these companies, I mean, where do you start? If a company's just coming to you or a team's yeah. company and they're like, or a leader and they're like, look, I don't, I don't really have a lot of, direction I, I see what you're saying i see the trend i want to be a part of it I, where do do i uh focus on just getting everybody to breathe in oxygen and and get and help everybody uh by coaching them on how to do that and that's maybe part of it i mean what wh where do you what do you do with with companies that they think culture is you know happy hours and pool tables and ping pong tables and you know yeah. dogs at work and stuff I, I feel like that's kind of had a hangover, right? Especially now that yep. we're like, well, just have yep. my dog at my house. What, what, you know, what do you, what do you do with that? This, this misconception of culture, right? Cause I, th I think yeah, everybody's totally. kind of having to rethink that. Totally. Yeah. And what I well, first I'd say is, is that I, I'm not, I'm not the best fit for everybody. So, um, so there are companies that, that come to me and if, if they, if they are in the mindset of thinking that culture is just ping pong tables and jeans Fridays, uh, mm -hmm. and that they just that's they just need more of that and that that's the answer, then I, I probably am not the best fit for them. Jeans Fridays and ping pong tables are an outgrowth of a a culture. It's not the culture. Culture is dynamic, which means it's being created moment by moment, every single day mm -hmm. by everyone throughout your ecosystem on the way that you think, the way that you act, and the way you interact. And so ping pong tables and uh, jeans Fridays and whatever are just strategies to help with that ecosystem around thinking, acting, and interacting. But if you have a natural desire that you want to have greater alignment with your people on what is that desired culture we're trying to create, then I'm a good fit for you. And what yeah. that be, really begins is by me listening and trying to understand, it's not about me coming in from the outside and telling you what your culture ought to be, because it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. And, I, like, and, and who the hell am I? And, and it doesn't matter that way. But what I am is a partner in helping you understand what is the culture you're trying to create and getting clear on that. And mm -hmm. then from a intentional, there is a culture shaping process to then say, all right, based on that, well, how are we going to lead the kind of change that we want? And so how are we going to develop our own the leadership perspective on creating that culture every day? How is it we're going to structural from an organizational development side of things? 
how we hire, how we onboard, how we do yeah. performance evaluations, how we identify emerging leaders throughout and develop their thinking, acting and interacting. So they build habits that we want and they want to we want to retain great people. All of those things are intentional strategies that get deployed based on clarity around the mission, vision, and values, and the culture that we're committed to, to creating together. Then ongoing coaching and developing, is, is that's the breathing of the oxygen, is once we get clear on all that and we understand, again, now I'm layering in different ones of my books, but once we understand the temperature of the thermostat culture we're trying to create, we don't know yes. what temperature is that we're, we're aiming for, then, then anything goes. Right. And right. Our culture right. becomes more like a thermometer that just goes up and down depending on who's in the room. A thermostat regulates it. So once we get clear on the structure, then from a leadership perspective, we're going to have to breathe oxygen into it over time to build yeah. the thinking, acting and interacting to support it. When I'm guessing there needs to be a cadence, right? So I, I've, I've, I worked with the uh, entrepreneur oper operating system with one of my companies for a long yeah. time. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with, with that, yeah, with traction yeah. and whatnot, but they, there's some just great ways that they're able to take five years and bake it down into a day or yep. 90 minutes. And, and that, that was really helpful for me. Is that some of the stuff that you, you will get with as far as like creating something that can be duplicated and has that like ongoing um, we're constantly having at least a little bit of time each week or each day to work on the business instead of in the business or on the culture instead of in the culture. Absolutely. Is that part we've of it? To, we, yeah, we've got to get intentional about if that is truly, if we're committed to this future culture we're trying to create, then we've got to reverse engineer it and, and be able, begin to understand, well, then what does that look like? What are we going to intentionally do individually and collectively over the next 30 days? Over the next mm -hmm. 60 days, 90 days, over the next three years, five years, what is our intentional strategy to then anchor this culture that we're trying to create in everything that we do so that five years from now, 10 years from now, people in this company say, oh, yeah, at this company, this is just the air that we breathe. Well, yeah, it is now, but we've changed the entire ecosystem by yeah. very intentionally breathing new oxygen into it over years. And, 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 and in part, sometimes you have to learn this by knowing, having breathed in pollution and knowing where the pollution is and it's a journey, right? So it, it, it takes time, and, but it definitely most importantly takes willingness, I think, and honesty and open-mindedness. And so I love what you're saying there. One last question I had uh, before we go, you know, Building a team is so important, and I I, yep. I put a lot of emphasis on that because I I would never be where I am without the team that I have. Like no matter how you split it, um, no doubt you got to have a team. Even if you're a solopreneur, you still have a team around you um, that you're utilizing. So, you know, is that is that a big thing now too? Is it? Do you believe that it's better to hire for people that you, at least from what you can tell during the maybe the interview process or the getting to know them process? Um, that the priority is, do, are they capable of being a part of this culture and being a part of what we want to breathe in more so than what their expertise are or how much uh, experience they have and whatever tactic they're going to be delivering at the business or on the yeah, team? We're getting more and more sophisticated with our hiring practices, we meaning globally, of understanding yeah. that that hiring A is, is a, is a two-way street. And so they are very, as much interviewing us as we are interviewing them. And especially of in, course. Employee, in employee market that we're in right now. And, yeah. and again, with, with all our, the, the, the people out there that are asking the question of the number one question they're asking is in every job interview and every job fair right now in the world, the number one question people are asking is not tell me what you do as a business. It's not tell me what the role is that you're, that I'm, I might be hired for. It's not tell me what my compensation is. It's, you tell me about your culture. Tell me about your culture. Because mm -hmm. I want to, as in, I, the two-way street is, I, as the potential person, maybe accepting your offer, if you, accept, if you offer it, I want to know, do I feel like this is a cultural fit for me as a human? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we as organizations are getting more sophisticated in, in asking questions and the process of hiring, of making sure that we're hiring for cultural alignment 
not necessarily, you know, I think culture fit gets thrown around, but I think culture alignment means that we're, we're in alignment of what we're trying to create together. And do we, do we both kind of opt in to bringing our gifts and strengths to try to, to lead that and, and set that temperature for the long term. And then again, it's not just about hiring. It's from the very beginning of that onboard people into our cultures is now we're getting yeah. even better and more sophisticated that, uh, you know, onboarding is not an orientation, you know, it's not right. a one day thing. So culturally aligning is something that never stops throughout a team or organization. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, this is, this is a lot, uh, and really good. I'm excited about, uh, how this went today. And I appreciate you coming on because this is, uh, I know you got a lot of stuff going on and, and, you know, one thing, um, I was curious about where is the book already published or and out on the, uh, at the stores or is it, uh, yeah, about to I'm, be out? I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to announce that it just, uh, it just launched, uh, on August 2nd. Uh, and so you can get it wherever it is that you awesome. get books, but, uh, really, exciting to announce that it was the number one new release on Amazon and business and organizational learning and workplace culture just last week. So uh, wow. it's getting a tremendous response and, uh, congratulations. And really, That's really cool. Really cool to see that it's not just an idea that people are, uh, enjoying, but that the actual content is resonating and adding value to people and teams and organizations. I love it. Awesome. And then I'm, I'm guessing you, you, do you have a site? as far as if I want to learn more about the uh, speaking or whatnot, if we want to book you for an event. Yeah. If you go to Jason V Barger.com, Jason V as in Victor, Jason V Barger.com. Uh, and then on social media, it's just at Jason V Barger. Um, Got gotcha. Track me down. Got to have that V in there. Cause there's some other Jason Barger coming That's up. right, man. There's somebody oh, else out the there. The worst. That's yeah. Right. There's another Frankie Russo uh, up in Jersey. He's a radio host and uh, it's a constant battle with that guy for SEO results. But, uh, <laughs> you know, what are you, you going to do? What are you going to do? That's right. Anyway, this has been awesome, man. Thanks so much for being on the School of Y podcast. And, and uh, I'm looking forward to, you know, continuing to run into you, especially out there uh, in the speaker world. And, um, yeah, anything I can do to help. Lo loved, uh, loved your content. Can't wait to read your book. Thanks, man. I appreciate you having me on. And, uh, yeah, likewise, I, lo I love what you're doing. So uh, helping people connect to that why is uh, critical. So. Keep it up, man, and uh, keep in touch. Right on, brother. Talk to you soon.